This is America on the Road, named best radio show by the International Automotive Media Conference, and now in its 31st year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. I'm Jack Nierad, and with me is co-host Chris Teague. Chris, it's great to be with you as always. It's great to be with you as well, Jack. Summer is uh, winding down. The kids start school next week. Uh, time is flying. How are things on uh, yeah. your side of the world? Really true. Time is flying. And, uh, you know, I'm a summer guy, so I hate to see summer end. I hate to see us roll into September, but that's what's happening here. I, so there you go. Yeah, year is Lock. quickly flying. It's so true. Uh, interesting news this week. Tesla Motors is returning to an old marketing scheme by offering cash for referrals. It could save uh, you a substantial amount of money if you plan to buy an EV soon. So we'll have the details on that. There's crankiness in Detroit as a union leader suggests that the CEO of a global automaker resign. It's a dispute over the reopening of a factory. We'll tell you who's who and the why's on that one coming up. On a happier note, Haggerty is getting ready to display some life-size versions of classic Hot Wheels vehicles on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. I'm going to ask you about Hot Wheels coming up, Chris. And the slow rollout of the electric vehicle charging network is getting a lot of people hot under the collar. Now the federal government is poised to spend more than $500 million in that effort. We'll tell you more. Chris is an expert on that. You think you're going to get more chargers in your town based on that, Chris? I certainly hope so, Jack. <laughs> we shall see, right? Yeah. America on the Road is brought to you by drivingtoday.com, emlancy.com, the publisher of my latest book, Dance in the Dark, and Mercury Insurance. If you're looking to save some money, you should switch to Mercury for your auto and home insurance. Californians save an average of $670 with Mercury. So imagine how much you could save. Get a quote today at drivingtoday.com slash auto insurance. That's drivingtoday.com slash auto hyphen insurance. Well, as you longtime listeners to the show know, Chris lives at one end of the country. I live at the other. Each week we get together to talk about cars, the car industry, how you can save some money on your car. And as you mentioned, Chris, Labor Day is upon us. Um, is it a big tourist weekend in your neck of the woods? You know, it's funny, Jack. All summer long, we see all the Florida and New York license plates filing in. And then Labor Day weekend, they're all on the way out. So it'll be pretty quiet here after that. Yeah, I'll bet. What vehicle will you be road testing this week? I spent a week with the 2025 Infiniti QX80. It's a full-size luxury SUV, and I can't wait to tell you all about it. Well, I look forward to hearing about that. My test car this week was the 2024 Volkswagen ID.4 Pro S. I'll tell you all about that later in the show. This week, our special guest is Mike Weller. He's brand manager for the Ford Bronco Sport. I had a chance to speak with him at length about the exciting changes to the 2025 Bronco Sport, so I think you'll enjoy hearing what he has to say. So we have a lot of show for you this week. Stay with us, and we'll be right back right here on America on the Road. Welcome back to America on the Road with Chris Teague, Jack Nerad back with you. And we're so glad you're with us. Thanks so much for joining us on America on the Road. We do appreciate it. And if you like the show, please pass it along to somebody who might also like the show. We'd love to have that and help the show grow. And that'll help us overall. So we'd appreciate that very much. Uh, fascinating news this time around, Chris, about Tesla uh, kind of re-upping on uh, a um, marketing scheme that he used previously um, using referrals, then it kind of went away from it. And now the referrals are back and it's offering up to a thousand dollars off the purchase of a Model S, a Model X, a Model Y, or a Model 3 when you use a particular referral code. Uh, what's your take on this? Well, I think if I'm Tesla or Elon Musk, I'm looking at other automakers and seeing the progress they've made uh, with their electric vehicles, and I, I would probably look to boost my sales a little bit. And this is a great way to do it for them. Yeah, the the good news is there's money in this for everybody. The person who provides the referral, typically a Tesla owner, will get a $500 credit, and that can be applied to a product, including vehicles. So, you know, 500 bucks off a Tesla, not a bad thing, or Tesla gear or stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, Tesla had scaled back on incentives, but it cut prices. It kind of goes back and forth on this. I think Tesla can move much quicker than uh, the typical car company can because it doesn't have dealers. And so um, this seems to work out. They had feedback. They'd done some other kind of referrals where they were offering supercharger miles, uh, things like that. 
Uh, that didn't go so well, but this seems to be going quite well, and uh, this seems to be something people want. I mean, free money is something a lot of people want, right? Yeah, and they don't spend money on advertising either, so this is you know, yet another way for them to get out. And I have to say, there's nobody better to promote your products than the Tesla diehards, because they are seriously committed to those vehicles. Boy, are they ever. Do you get a little uh, flack from Tesla diehards when you're plugging in your Honda Prologue? <laughs> doing well, that? We don't actually have any superchargers nearby. We have a few destination chargers, which are like the slower level twos, but uh, no, none yet. I think it probably helps. Uh, the, the Honda Prologue looks like a normal vehicle, so uh, <laughs> it blends in pretty well with others on the road. Yeah, okay. Don't get miserable stares and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Here's something interesting. I'm not sure whether this is good labor relations, terrible labor relations or what, but uh, a uh, union leader, a guy from the United Auto Workers Union, Kevin Gatinsky, uh, has suggested that Stellantis CEO Carlos Tavares resign. <laughs> Just quit. And uh, this is the quote. I found this uh, interesting. This is over a, a uh, dispute over a plant opening in Belvedere, Illinois. A uh, plant that's been closed for a while. I think the union was hoping it would re reopen, and uh, what's going on with Stellantis dictates that they don't do that. They don't need that production. But this is what Gatinsky says I, uh, ab about the CEO of this company of Stellantis. I think he either needs to go and get someone close to, by him to work side by side with him to manage the company, because I don't think he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and you know, I don't know that that's. Well, you know, I think union leaders have a tendency to uh, strike out sometimes at CEOs of uh, companies with which they are trying to uh, negotiate. Uh, maybe he doesn't really mean it, but uh, I, I just kind of found that amusing <laughs> as a way to <laughs> yeah, deal that's with a, stuff. That's a pretty strongly worded statement, but it's also interesting. It seems like Stellantis has run afoul of the union a few times in recent uh, years, I'll say. Uh, I believe uh, earlier this year there was a, a story where uh, the union was upset with them for health and safety issues at one of their factories. And, uh, you know, you just don't see too many of those things coming out of other automakers. So it is interesting. Yeah. Well, I think Stellantis is struggling a bit, and uh, that's a difficult thing for them. The unions would like them to open this plant, and I, there's just not the demand for vehicles that were previously built there. So uh, I don't, <laughs> you know, as a CEO, you much as you'd like to have more production, if you don't, if you can't sell them, you can't can't do that and can't yeah, use that. True. Here's a happier story. It's about Hot Wheels, and I, I'm curious about you and Hot Wheels. Were were you uh, as a kid? Did you play with Hot Wheels? Do you think Hot Wheels were cool? Oh, I did. I have a huge cardboard box uh, full of them here that my daughter plays with, um, you know, sometimes. And occasionally, I'll stop by the aisle and take a look and see if there's something that I want to pick up, and I sometimes buy them now. Yeah, there you go. Well, I like Hot Wheels, too. I, I kind of was uh, almost an adult when Hot, Hot Wheels really kind of took hold. Uh, but um, this is cool because Haggerty, of course, Haggerty Insurance and those folks, uh, Haggerty does a lot of stuff with collector cars. And they're going to be showing some full-size versions of uh, some classic Hot Wheels vehicles on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. coming up in September, coming up pretty soon in a couple of weeks, three weeks or so. Um including uh, a vehicle called the Beatnik Bandit, which was released in 1961. Hey, I was a kid in 1961. <laughs> Why didn't I get that? Uh, you know, I wasn't 41 in 1961, I can tell you that. Uh, this is a vehicle uh, that was styled by Ed Big Daddy Roth, a well-known car customizer. It was built on an Oldsmobile chassis, so that's going to be kind of cool. Um, and then... Uh, another vehicle they're going to show is a uh, customized Dodge A100 pickup, which was uh, redesigned or kind of this um, version was designed by Harry Bradley, a guy I know, a car designer I know, and a very prominent car designer who kind of was um, the guru of Hot Wheels for years and years and years. So uh, pretty cool to see uh, full size versions of these things. I think are really, really cool. Yeah, I love them. You know, the detail work that goes into these vehicles, looking at the Beatnik Bandit, I mean, they're completely impractical. <laughs> but man, the, the artistry and the, the craftsmanship in a lot of these vehicles are just amazing. Yeah, very cool. Uh, Bradley, who I, I met later, later in his life, uh, 
uh, did a lot of great stuff and, and spoke actually at the Motor Press Guild, I think, uh, at times, which is where I, I believe I met him. And uh, this stuff is going to be shown on the National Mall, as I mentioned, uh, between September 19th and September 22nd, kind of a narrow window, but, uh, you know, check it out. I think September 22nd is the is the best day to see it because uh, both of those vehicles will be on display then and, and pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about this $500 million that's going to boost the EV charging network. Uh, you know, I guess there's been some na gnashing of teeth over a lot of money had been expended, I think, in IRA and some other, um, you know, major uh, congressional uh, legislation that had been passed. But uh, the rollout has been very, very slow. And um, now I think they're trying to pick up the pace a bit. Um, well, I think one uh, one of the heads of the federal uh, the head of the Federal Highway Administration said that uh, about the fact that just seven EV charging stations had been deployed uh, deployed under this program uh, in, uh, recently was uh, you know kind of a terrible result and kind of embarrassing. Uh, you've written about this. What's your take on this whole thing? Yeah, the, the rollout has been extremely slow. I mean, I read those numbers this morning and I was shocked that they had, there was so few that they had actually built. But I like the way it's structured, right? So depending on the state, the funds will be used for different measures. I think California is getting uh, funding to build commercial hydrogen and electric uh, fueling stations for trucks, like large trucks and vehicles. And a lot of them are th that's aimed at serving what they call underserved communities or uh, you know more rural areas, which as we've talked about, like here in Maine, that'll be very helpful because you know we don't we have one high speed charger here in my town, and the next one is 30 or 40 minutes away. So it's all going to be helpful for EV owners. Yeah, absolutely, it should be, and I'd like to see a, a quicker rollout. At the same time, it's kind of interesting to me we don't see federally funded rollouts of gas stations, and I'm wondering, and I, maybe you understand it because I certainly don't why we can't have a similar kind of situation where you know commercial profit profit oriented companies get into this business and roll these things out themselves without uh, requiring half a billion dollars in federal funds yeah i don't have a good explanation for that one but i will say i think the the order of events here has been kind of cart before the horse or egg before the chicken however you want to put it uh, we went whole hog on promoting electric vehicles with tax credits and everything. Uh, and then the, the country is woefully underprepared to support them once they're on the road. So, uh, you know, I guess I, I see the, the logic behind it, but I have no explanation for that one. Yeah, well, I don't think many of us do, uh, but there you go. Well, and Chris will be road testing the 2025 Infiniti QX80, a large sport utility vehicle from that luxury manufacturer. And I'll be te road testing the 2024 Volkswagen ID4 Pro S. So stay with us for that. And we'll have a lot more coming up right here on America on the Road. Welcome back to America on the Road with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nierad back with you. And we're so glad you're with us right here on America on the Road. It is road test time and we have some Fascinating road test vehicles. I haven't road tested an Infinity in quite some time. You were at the wheel of uh, one of their flagships, I think, Chris. Uh, tell us about it. I was, Jack. It's a 2025 QX80. Um, it's in a new generation for the model year. So uh, when it arrives, it's not quite on sale yet, I don't believe. Um, it's completely redesigned. It still looks very similar to the old model. Uh, when was the last time you drove a QX80 and what did you think of it? Well, it's, in, it's probably several years ago. I think it's one of those sleepers, I think, in the luxury um, luxury segments, probably pretty uh, easy to buy and, and get a discount on. And I think it does a lot of things right. Yeah, you know, Nissan and Infiniti are both kind of under the radar right now. I think they, they've got some work to do. But uh, this vehicle starts at, a, at around $84,500 for the base pure model. I tested the range topping autograph, uh, Jack, and it's $112,600 uh, plus a few options and destinations. So absolutely not what I would consider to be an affordable SUV, but you do get quite a bit for the money. Uh, now, with this generational update, Infiniti dropped the uh, V8 from the old model, so you don't get the, the beefy, naturally aspirated sound anymore. But you do get a twin turbocharged 3.5 liter V6 
uh, with 450 horsepower and 516 pounds of torque. So uh, you definitely didn't lose much of anything here other than the V8 sound. Uh, my vehicle had all a uh, four-wheel drive, not all-wheel drive, and a nine-speed automatic transmission. And the interesting thing for me here, Jack, and I know you own a, a full-size Chevy SUV, this vehicle can tow 8,500 pounds when it's equipped with the tow hitch or the package, uh, which is pretty stout for such a luxurious vehicle. Um, do you, or have you done a lot of towing with your with your Chevy? Not very much. Uh, I don't have really have anything to tow, but I think I could tow <laughs> quite a bit with it. Um, I, I have put a bicycle rack into the, the tow hitch uh, receiver, and uh, that's worked out pretty well. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty stout number, as I said, for this SUV. So you could definitely get away with pulling a small boat or a box trailer or something like that. Um, and the large SUV, it's a very large SUV, three rows. Uh, it handles pretty well. It's got a smooth ride, and it doesn't feel very truck-like, even though it's body on frame. So you're not feeling jittery or, you know, there's not a lot of crashing and, and things like that. Uh, I really like the steering and the brake feel in this vehicle. I mean, it's a large, not very well-performing SUV, but uh, there's decent steering feel and the brakes feel very solid. So uh, I think that, you know, even though it is so large, you're not going to feel like uh, you're kind of being pulled around by it. You, you feel in control. Um, despite going to a smaller engine jack, this vehicle still doesn't do very well on the fuel economy front, uh, only getting about 16 MPG in the city and 19 on the highway. And that's poor in its segment. So the other vehicles, uh, many other vehicles in the segment beat it pretty handily uh, on fuel economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, depending on how you set it up, if you get second row captain's chairs, you can seat seven people. If you get a bench seat in the second row, you can seat eight. Mine had the captain's chairs, which as we've talked about many times, I enjoy with children. You just have more space between them and they, uh, and you also have easier access to the third row seat. Um, the base pure trim comes with synthetic leather. You get heated and powered, uh, power adjustable front seats and memory settings. My range topping model had semi aniline leather, uh, really nicely stitched diamond pattern, really gorgeous leather in this vehicle. Um, you get heated and ventilated front seats with massage features and heated second and third row seats. So uh, everybody in the house can have a warm rear uh, in this vehicle. Now, Which is nice in Maine, I imagine. Huh? Oh yeah, even though it's you know we're still in the 70s now, so not no, no need for it just yet. Uh, there's plenty of room in this vehicle, Jack. You know I've said the word large and imposing, you know, for the to describe it a few times now, but that really does equate to a lot of interior space. The front seats are very wide, they're deep, they're extremely well padded, and I could almost stretch out even in my driving position, almost uh, you know extend my legs all the way. Second row seat is very much the same. The kids have tons of room back there, even with my seat pushed back. You know, we haven't talked about my height in a while, but at six feet, you know, I have to push the seat back a little bit uh, and they still have plenty of room. Uh, on the tech front, I enjoy Nissan and Infiniti's infotainment software. Jack, what do you think about it compared to Toyota, Honda, some of the major competitors? I think Infiniti and, and Nissan, by extension, ha has done a good job with their infotainment systems. I, they're not particularly flashy, but I think they're pretty easy to use. And I think that is key, especially when you're driving a vehicle, that uh, it not be very complicated. Yeah, one of the things I really enjoy about it, and I'm actually testing the Nissan uh, Z this week, is the resolution of their display screens feel or seems stronger, higher than others. And what that is, is you, it really does look like you're looking at a laptop screen. Uh, it's just such a high quality image. But uh, the QX80 comes with dual touch screens. So you get a 14.3 inch upper display and a nine inch lower display, and also a 14.3 inch gauge cluster. You also get wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, uh, Amazon Alexa functionality, uh, Google navigation, and the range topping model came with a 24 speaker Klipsch audio system. And I have to tell you, Jack, that <laughs> with the volume up a little bit, you can hear this thing coming down the road. It sounds fantastic. It's extremely loud, um, so no complaints there. And then on the safety front, you get a full suite of, of, uh, of safety equipment here with blind spot monitoring, forward collision alerts, and all the rest. So, you know, I think even though it's kind of an also ran in the segment, you know, Infinity is not quite as popular as some others, and the price is a little high. This is a very nice SUV, Jack, and, and I think that it would be good for people who like the brand, and especially if you need to haul people in gear. Yeah, cool car, and I, I bet you could get a discount if, if you play <laughs> your cards right. Go yeah. to an Infinity dealer. Maybe so. So look for that. 
Sounds like a, a cool op opportunity there. Yeah. I, w I was driving the 2024 Volkswagen ID4 Pro S, uh, one of the latest versions of the Volkswagen ID4. Of course, it's an electric SUV. It's built in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, Volkswagen has committed uh, a whole bunch to building electric vehicles, and including this plant in Chattanooga that I visited several years ago. Um, this is a vehicle that's about the same size as a Volkswagen Tiguan, or maybe even more familiar to you, a Honda CRV or something like that. So about a, a you know compact SUV. Pretty roomy though, because it makes use of the electric drivetrain to make the in interior a little uh, more roomy than uh, the typical gas-powered vehicle of the same size would be. Um, I think it's a good-looking vehicle. I think it still looks good, even though it's been on the market for quite a while now. Um, they've done some improvements to the vehicle and the rear drive models, including the one I, I drove, now um, offer up to 291 miles of range on a charge, so that's good. They've also upgraded the infotainment display. Everybody's doing that, putting in bigger screens, and this now has a 12.9 inch infotainment uh, screen. It also has a lot of stuff buried in the screen, so <laughs> you, you use the screen a lot. Um, prices range from about $42,000 up well over $55,000 if you equip it fairly well. And um, they've up the DC fast charging ability of the Pro models, so I like that. Um, the base model has 201 horsepower, has a single rear mounted motor. Uh, the vehicle I had has a single rear mounted motor, but it has 282 horsepower. So I like that. Um, and you know, not super fast, but not slow, kind of uh, maybe five second or so, zero to 60 in that range. Certainly enough pep, uh, I think, uh, for this. Um, it gets a uh, pretty good fuel economy. I think 113 MPGE, uh, you know, miles per gallon equivalent, which is a good number um, and a lot of safety equipment too. Uh, the vehicle I had, as I mentioned, had 282 horsepower rear drive. Um, the range I talked about, 20 inch alloy wheels. Um, give me your take. I, I don't know that you've driven an ID4, but you've certainly seen a few. Uh, what's your take overall on what Volkswagen is doing here? Yeah, I agree with you on the styling. I think it looks great. I think the interior is premium. It looks nice inside, and Volkswagen does pretty well with using nice materials. One thing I did want to ask you, Jack, if you know, is your was your test vehicle built in Chattanooga, or is it still a, a German or foreign built? You know, vehicle? I'm not a, exactly sure. I have the Monroni here, and if I had my whoa, if I had bang, if I had my reading glasses, I could probably determine <laughs> where it was built. But I'm not certain. My guess is it was built in Chattanooga, but I don't know that for sure. Okay. So I'll I'll check back and we can report that on a on the next show. <laughs> but it has a lot of cool stuff in it. Uh, it has uh, dual automatic climate control. It has an air filter, of course. Uh, I think most things are going to have air filters. It has steering wheel controls, a heated heated steering wheel, tilt and telescoping steering column, heated and ventilated seats. You know, the, the Pro version, the Pro S version is pretty well equipped. Uh, the prices tested was about $52,000. So that's a lot of money for a vehicle that's the same size as a CRV. It has leatherette seating surfaces as opposed to leather seating. Here's one of the things that, it, you know, kind of bugs a little bit. And I don't know why they did this. And mostly I like this car, so don't get me wrong. But this, this is the bug to me. Uh, instead of having four discrete window switches for the driver. It has two window switches and another switch where you toggle it back and forth between front and rear. And I absolutely do not see the logic in that whatsoever. I kept rolling down <laughs> the, the uh, rear window as opposed to the uh, my window uh, whenever, I, and it's just like, well, why is this? This is, it, it, you say a button, Okay, uh, and you end up, uh, you know, upsetting the the driver all the time and and making him feel stupid. And I feel stupid enough without <laughs> not having the the windows which is rub it in my face. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, uh, there's no need, there's no need to reinvent the wheel every single time you you create a new vehicle. We've talked about this with gear shift levers and buttons and things and it's just another step of distraction right you got to stop and think about wh which window you're rolling down instead of just instinctively grabbing the correct button to do it 
Right. I mean, the other thing that's a bit disconcerting is it doesn't have an on and off switch. It doesn't have a start button. It uh, begins to operate when it senses you're sitting in the seat. <laughs> and then when you get out of the seat and get out of the vehicle, it, it turns off. But I, I'm never quite convinced <laughs> that it knows that I'm either in or I'm out. You know, I so that's a kind of a little weird situation, too. This is a very likable vehicle. I think, uh, you know, prices of all electrics are, are pretty high. Um, but um, this is a, a pretty good vehicle to take a look at, I think, uh, if you're looking for a vehicle of that size. A lot to like about it. I agree. When we come back, we will have a special guest. His name is Mike Weller. He is the brand manager of the Ford Bronco Sport. And he knows more about the Ford Bronco Sport for 2025 than anybody I can think of. So we'll be speaking with him about that. Stay with us for that, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack Nee Red back with you. We are outside Knoxville, Tennessee, in the beautiful Smoky Mountains at the uh, newest of the Bronco Rodeo sites with uh, Mike Weller um, of Ford, Bronco brand manager, Bronco Sport Bronco brand Sport, manager, that's right. brand manager. Uh, a lot to talk about, right? Yes. Yeah, so, you, you know, where do you want to begin? What, what do you think is the most important feature of the 2025 that you're presenting to people today? Yeah, um, the exciting news, of course, is the Sasquatch package now available on Bronco Sport. We made it available on the Badlands and the Outer Banks models. Um, the thing is incredible. We've had it on Bronco and people love it. And we've adapted that and brought that capability to Bronco Sport. And it is the real deal. It's I awesome. think what you found was uh, when you launched Bronco Sport, certainly a, a major success for Ford Motor Company, both the Broncos actually, but Bronco Sport maybe not, doesn't get the, <laughs> the, uh, the acclaim that the Bronco does in terms of being a success, but a very big success for Ford. You found that uh, those buyers wanted more capability, yeah. right? And uh, so that in response, you're doing that. Exactly. Yeah, the Badlands model was already um, second to none in the segment, um, but our customers, we spent a lot of time with them. We went off-roading with them, we went camping with them, um, and they, they demanded more. So we, we, dialed, we dialed it up, um, not just a capability upgrade from a suspension and, and, uh, and other aspects, but we also dialed up the, the durability and the toughness with things like underbody protection. Yeah, I want to talk about that because there's a lot of profilers, I think, in mm -hmm. this in this segment, you know, the compact utility segment is a major segment. I think it's the, the uh, hottest selling segment in, in the entire market. There's a lot of vehicles that would like to look like they go off road, but don't necessarily have yep. have the chops. Yep. Walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, uh, everything we developed is the real deal. We've got steel plated bumpers um, meant to be a, a robust contact point for off roading, steel bash plates, uh, steel everything under body. Um, so it, it, it's the real deal. And then we've got casted recovery points um, for the, the inevitable instance where you're stuck somewhere. Or we've all been there. Um, so it's all robust, intentional, and, um, yeah, absolutely intended for the customer to, mm -hmm. to take this thing off. Road. Walk us through some of the features of the Sasquatch package. Yeah. Frankly, it starts with your connection to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so we brought um, Goodyear all-terrain tires, the Goodyear territory that was... Uh, built on the Bronco Sasquatch. We brought that to the Bronco Sports. So we've got 29 inch Goodyear tires. They're the largest in the class. And those are really aggressive and actually intentionally designed for um, fast driving off road. So it's a lot of fun. Right. And can be deflated and, uh, yeah. you know, yep. okay for that. And right? you've got yeah. aggressive tread on the outer wall of the tire. So when you deflate a little bit, you, you maintain a lot of grip. So mm -hmm. um, really awesome tires. Um, Sasquatch also adds, as I mentioned, the recovery points. You got four on each side of the vehicle, sorry, one on each side of the vehicle. Um, D-ring in the rear and cast it up front. And speaking of up front, mm -hmm. bolted to the recovery hooks is a brush guard. So that'll protect your front grill. And again, it's steel. It's not going anywhere. And that's it's yeah. a really awesome feature. I mean, a lot of your uh, off-roading kind of customers demanded steel up yep. front, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep, that's what they need. They need the actual protection because, frankly, with Bronco Sport, a lot of our customers, or most of our customers really, this is their daily driver. Mm -hmm. They need it to go to and from work, take their kids to school, go get groceries, um, but they absolutely love being outdoors and going off-road. So they need to have that confidence that they can um, take it off-road, have a ton of fun, but it not go out of service during the week. Right, right. 
and that it works well as that. I mean, it, it's inexpensive to buy. I think mm -hmm. it's pretty inexpensive to own. A good fuel economy, mm -hmm. for example. Um, doesn't beat you up by day to day as you're commuting in this vehicle. You can use it as a day to day vehicle with a great deal of utility exactly. and then, then go off road. So mm -hmm. it's a great situation. Isn't it? And speaking of that day to day use case, we also standardized a ton of technology in the vehicle and made a lot of upgrades. So we've now got a class leading 13.2 inch center screen that brings Sync 4. Sync 4 brings a wireless car plane Android Auto. We've now added a standard wireless charging pad and we've also standardized our assisted driver technology. So code Ford Copilot 360 Assist Plus, which has things like adaptive cruise control with lane centering and even stop and go, that's standard, blind, stop mon blind spot monitoring. So we made the day-to-day -day drive during the week, like I mentioned, right. a lot more um, pleasing, mm -hmm. and then we, we well, dialed it up yeah. for the off-road. Big digital display, mm -hmm. driver instrumentation. I mean, like a luxury vehicle, you'd pay extra for, you know, something like a 13, I think it's 13.2 inch or yep. something like that. Uh, digital instrument display. Uh, Big screen infotainment with Sync 4 that works really, really well. So your day-to-day -day is covered. I mean, exactly. I am uh, reviewing infotainment systems as much as I'm reviewing powertrains mm -hmm. these days when I'm talking about vehicles. But let's talk a little bit about powertrain sure. in this vehicle. Yep. So we'll, we're, our powertrains are carryover from the offering from 2024. So we have the 1.5 liter engine, which is available on everything other than the Badlands. And then your Badlands gets the 2 liter engine. Mm -hmm. And horsepower and torque, give me kind of ballpark figures. Yep, we're 238 in the 2 liter and 180 on the um, on the 1.5. Mm -hmm. I want to check back on torque. I don't want to give you wrong yeah, numbers. Yeah, okay. Uh, goat modes. Yes. You kind of upgraded that whole situation, Definitely. right? Yeah. So I think one of the ones that will stand out to a lot of people. So we've got five goat modes in um, all of our vehicles, but Badlands. Badlands has seven. But one of the changes to those five was we now have an off-road mode. In 2024, that mode was called sand. Off-road makes it a more um, expands where you can. It's ecumenical. It's yes. any kind of off-road. Exactly. Kind right. of, and it, and the vehicle kind of senses what it needs to do, right? And mm -hmm. and, and adapts that. Yep. Way. It upgrades the throttle response, the brake response, um, the gear ratios, and a lot of other things. Um, so off-road mode's really great. And then with Badlands, I mentioned there's seven. So the two additional are our new rally mode, which we're super excited about, mm -hmm. and then rock crawl mode. And the rally modes for going fast on sand and yes. that kind of thing, yep. kind of maybe western desert. I yep. guess there's sand running in other areas too, but that is kind of primarily that exactly. Yeah, Badlands Sasquatch feels most at home, ripping it over sand dunes. Um, we even have an upgraded 850 watt cooling fan, as well as other coolings throughout the suspension and other parts of the vehicle. So it's meant for that hot high speed running over sand and, and it is hot it can be hot. fun yeah, yeah yeah it's super uh, super fun what uh, what are some of the features you really like about this vehicle uh, some something that's important to you maybe in your day-to-day -day life something yeah. you, you run into you know that you just feel wow this is really pretty mm -hmm. good i think one of the really creative features that was added was fender tie downs on mm -hmm. either, either side of the vehicle so for my day-to-day -day, uh, my wife and i have a paddle board ah, and okay. right now with our 24 sport we lower the rear seats. Okay. We open up the flip. Stand up gas. paddle board. Or yes. Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love them. And um, in order to carry it, it sticks out the back of our vehicle. Mm -hmm. Now with these fender tie downs that are integrated within to, within the side of the vehicle, we can secure it on the top of our vehicle. Those straps go off to the side, so they're not within my field of view, and they're not going to rub on the paint. And they're either. not rubbing on the paint. Exactly That's the thing. Right. I mean, I've had little sailboats and canoes all my life, mm -hmm. and uh, now stand up yeah. paddle boards too, and uh, that's important, you know, just to avoid that lines in your sight line or ropes in your sight line and uh, other things. It, it, yeah. It's a, a great feature. And it's, it's really well integrated, too, yeah. I think. Yeah. Genius feature and, yeah, absolute shout out to the team that developed it because yeah. it, it yeah. was really cool. Great, great, really smart. great stuff. Describe to me how the Bronco Sport customer differs from the Bronco customer because I think there's probably significant differences and then some similarities. Yeah, you know, definitely some different use cases. Um, I like to say if um, if the Bronco Sport can clear it from a ground clearance standpoint, it'll take on that obstacle. Um, so with Bronco, you get the higher ground clearance, among other things. Um, so we definitely see full-size Bronco customers off-roading even more than we see our Bronco Sport customers. And um, our Bronco Sport customers are really driving off-road. Um, we also have half of our Bronco Sport buyers are female. 
and mm. that's a, a great. I wondered about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. We have a lot of uh, we're reaching a, a, ton, a great audience with our Bronco Sports, um, and that's I, I think one of the differences between between the vehicles is just who who we're reaching. And are you following. finding that they're loving off roading? They're probably getting into off roading and doing that. Yeah, um, I I wish people would more. Um, <laughs> I think one of the uh, tools to help people get get more confidence in doing that is going to our Bronco Off Rodeo. We're we're at our fifth location now. Right. It's free for Bronco Sport buyers as well as it is for Bronco. Um, so the full day experience, you use our vehicles, not your own. You have expert trail guides to coach you the whole way. And we have people coming out of that with a absolute confidence that they can use right. their vehicle as right. it's intended. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is a sport that seems daunting, perhaps, if you haven't done it. But once you're doing it with experts, and I really recommend yep. doing it with experts to begin with, so the rodeo is the perfect place to, to get that expertise, then you feel much more comfortable about it. And it's not nuclear science. It's there's physics in it. Yeah. <laughs> There's geometry in it. Uh, all of those uh, sciences. But at the same time, it's just so much fun mm-hmm. as well. It is a ton of fun. I and you it. have these locations kind of not all over the country, right? The yes. Rodeos. We've got this will be our fifth location. Um, we've got one in New Hampshire, one in Austin, Texas, mm-hmm. one outside of Las Vegas, and then Moab, U- Moab Utah. Yeah. So now we've, we're, we're um, within 500 miles of 80% of our buyers, so it's really, really accessible. Right. And you're opening this up to non-Bronco owners, too, right? Yeah. I think that's a brilliant idea. Yeah. yeah. That was a new new introdu- introduction in the fourth quarter of 2024, where we introduced the half-day experience. Anyone can can uh, uh, go through that experience. It's about a four-hour experience, pay-as-you-go. Um, and yet, it, I think... Driving it, somebody's, uh, somebody else's vehicle off-road the way to start exactly right yeah, absolutely yeah, risk free yeah. can't beat it so and i think it's a great marketing move for ford and for bronco itself yeah 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 it's uh it's an experience that uh no one can touch us with it's yeah. great absolutely and it's taking some investment too mm-hmm. i mean these facilities don't <laughs> don't come out of thin yeah. air do they it's worth it though because customers that are going are, are remaining loyal to the ford brand because they they're really getting the most out of their vehicle right. we see accessory purchases we see People who bring guests are actually buying vehicles, so the investment's definitely worthwhile. Those of you associated with the Bronco brand, both Sport and and full-size Bronco, uh, have got to be gratified with what's happening with with this vehicle. I mean, I was telling somebody uh, on this trip, I mean, Bronco really is kind of the the last bastion of domestics in in my neighborhood in Mm. Southern California, right? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of Broncos and Bronco Sports, almost no other domestic vehicles from hmm. any manufacturer and it because this really resonates in a way that other vehicles don't i love to hear that um i think we appeal to a lot of different people because we have something for everyone we've got a four-door bronco a two-door bronco a bronco sport sasquatch the black diamond package available on big bend um, so we really have something for for everyone um, so the Bronco family as a whole with, with our three vehicles is, is a right. really great brand for and us. And Bronco Sport, very accessible. I think you can get into one for less than $30,000. Right. Uh, there's some damn few vehicles uh, of any type available for, for $30,000 or less than $30,000 these days. A yeah. uh, lot less one with kind of presence and a cool factor that you won't find in pretty much mm-hmm. the, the other vehicles, right? And don't forget all of the stuff that we've standardized, right? It's... Um, that that price point with the content you're getting, um, I think is is really unbeatable. Yeah, terrific, terrific. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me here. Thanks for standing and talking yeah, with me absolutely. about that I'd right in front of this wonderful Bronco Sport. And uh, Mike Weller, thanks so much for being with us. We Thank appreciate you. It. It's my pleasure. Fun product to work on. Glad yeah. you're here. Yeah, thanks a lot. And that was our interview with Ford's Mike Weller. He's the brand manager for the Ford Bronco Sport. Our thanks to him for joining us. Our thanks to Ford for the opportunity to get a very early drive of that Ford Bronco Sport for 2025. And we'll tell you all about that next week. So join us next week for that, that review. And we're so glad you're with us. Thanks so much for joining us on America on the Road. We do appreciate it. And if you like the show, please pass it along to somebody who might also like the show. We'd love to have that and help the show grow. And That'll help us overall, so we'd appreciate that very much. And stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here with more of America on the Road. Welcome back to America on the Road with Chris Teague. This is Jack D. Rad back with you, and it is question and answer time, our final segment of the day. Always nostalgic at this time, Chris, because we're not going to be speaking to each other maybe for a week or so, but... uh, (laughs) 
Great stuff. Oh, we're so glad that uh, everybody is joining us to listen to America on the Road. And if you like the show, please pass it along. We'd love to have you pass it, uh, pass a podcast or other version of the show to others and let them know about the show that we do about cars and about fun uh, driving cars. Uh, we also take listener questions. And if you have a listener question, send it to editor at drivingtoday.com. That's editor at drivingtoday.com. Here's a question we have for you, Chris. Uh, this is from Lonnie in Joliet, Illinois. Lonnie says this, I'm confused about hybrids. It seems like there are various types, plug-in hybrid, mild hybrid, just plain hybrid. Can you clarify what they are and tell me which one is best? Well, as with so many things in life, which one is best depends on a lot of factors, including how you drive, where you need to travel, and those sorts of things. But getting back to the original question, the three main types of hybrids, you get the mild hybrid, the full hybrid, and the plug-in. The mild hybrid is um, sort of the least of all three of these. Um, it's not like a, a regular hybrid. You can't travel on battery power alone. Um, it's usually like a 48 volt electric system. It helps power things like the air conditioner and things like that. It'll also let the engine shut off and you can coast a little bit if you're um, not under heavy load. What you will see, and you probably have seen this too, Jack, is that automakers have started using these mild hybrids to boost performance, like Mercedes adds this to some AMG cars and things like that. Full hybrids have a little bit larger uh, battery, probably a more powerful motor, uh, and they're, they're capable of traveling on, on battery power alone at low speeds for very limited periods of time. Uh, that helps them deliver uh, better in-town uh, fuel economy, but you don't see those benefits on the highway. Uh, Plug-in hybrids, as the name suggests, have to be plugged in to recharge the battery, uh, but they do typically offer between like 20 to 40 some odd miles of electric only range, which for some people would mean uh, going without gas for extended periods, especially if you don't have uh, a long commute. Uh, the, the downside to that is they're heavier, so if you don't charge the vehicle, you're lugging around all those extra components, and they're usually more expensive uh, than, than regular hybrids. So um, which one is best for you, I think will depend on you know where you land on that spectrum of use. Yeah, and in terms of cost, a mild hybrid, probably the least expensive. It adds some electric power and uh, typically through an electric motor in the transmission. Uh, and again, smaller battery, so it doesn't cost very much. Uh, and then the plug-in hybrid is much more expensive, typically a several thousand dollar premium over uh, even a hybrid or even a conventional vehicle. So it depends on what you want and uh, <laughs> how you use the vehicle, as you said so so rightly. That essentially wraps up our show for this week. Before we go, I'd like to mention my newest book, Dance in the Dark, a crime thriller inspired by true crime, available on Amazon in both ebook and paperback form. If you like our show, please pass it along. Listen on this radio station each week. Let your friends know where you listen to America on the Road. Get them up early to, to listen to it. And uh, you can get it as podcast too, can't you, Chris? You can, Jack. A quick Google search for America on the Road podcast will bring us to you on all the major platforms like Apple uh, Podcasts, Spotify, and all the others. Like us, download us, leave us a review. All those things help us out quite a bit. And you can take us with you wherever you go. We'd love to have you with us wherever you go. And we'd love to have you join us on Rumble and on YouTube because we do versions of the show there too. And individual road tests and some of our interviews are also up on those platforms. So look for that. And our thanks to the Sports Byline Network for carrying America on the road. Those stations are terrific and we love partnering with them to, to bring America on the road to you. And most of all, thanks to you for listening to America on the Road. We appreciate the fact that you've been with us. And we hope you'll join us again next time for another edition of America on the Road.